Hello, welcome to Government Connection. My name is Vicki Evans. The Earth's climate has changed many times during the planet's history, with events ranging from ice ages to long periods of warmth. But in a world populated as it is today with more than six billion humans, the dynamics of climate change and global warming really take on a new meaning. And to help us sort all of this out, we welcome Dr. Andrew Comrie. Thank you so much for being here. Be. And Dr. Comrie is a professor of geography and climatology at the University of Arizona. And uh, seated next to him is Dr. Barbara Warren, and thank you for being here. Okay. And uh, uh, Dr. Warren is a retired physician, and uh, she's representing this evening Physicians for Social Res Responsibility and Sustainable Tucson. So thank you for being here, Barbara. And we also welcome David Schaller. David, thanks thank for being here. And David is the administrator of the Office of Conserva Conservation and Sustainable Development with the City of Tucson. So in America, Andrew, we are not really sure if uh, is climate change a reality. This is true. A lot of people uh, seem to have uh, doubting attitudes here, and I think it's because it's a really, uh, to use a phrase we've heard before, it's something of an inconvenience. We, we like our ways. Um, the thing I like to talk about is uh, we, uh, we can worry about the future. Scientists have a lot to say about what is to be worried about, but the thing that's most persuasive to me is what's already happened, and indeed we see climate is changing before our eyes. Right. Um, shrinking glaciers, snow melt earlier, uh, you know, rivers uh, changing their patterns, all that sort of thing uh, we see going on right now, uh, and it's completely consistent with what we think is going to happen in the future, so we're worried. Is our drought, because we're at, what, David, nine-year drought we've been in, ten-year, in, in the Tucson one. Basin? And, uh, and, and is that it, considered part of climate change now, or is there an answer to that? Well, absolutely. The, the climate models all tell us that we're going to see precipitation occur more in the form of rain than snowfall, and that uh, it will come at, with different periods of intensity, different times of the year than maybe we're used to seeing them. And many models are suggesting that our primary sources of drinking water in the southwest, that is the Colorado River, uh, could be uh, shortchanged by that phenomenon in the form of uh, reduced volumes in our two big storage lakes, Lake Mead and Lake Powell. So you're saying we're going to have less water, right, because there'll be less precipitation? That's what the models seem to be telling us, and in, in, in a very uh, near term, my lifetime uh, wow. frame frame of time. Right. I, actually, I could add to that if you want. Not sure. only is it the amount of water, but it's the timing. If, even if we've got a little more water, let's say in winter, the way we manage those dams means that you also have to let water out at different times uh, for flood control <coughs> and for That's electricity. Right. So we have lots of competing interests on in how we use that water, not just how we would drink it. That's right. 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 So what are some of the other, are there, we've talked about water, what are uh, other potential effects of climate change here in the Southwest? Sea level rise. Um, that's I, I spend a lot of time working with um, uh, Pacific Islanders over the years, and there are already populations moving off of small islands because they can no longer uh, live a traditional lifestyle on some of the flat coral atolls in the Pacific. Uh, Saltwater intrusion from rising sea level makes it impossible to grow the food or to, or to uh, uh, store rainwater um, for very long. So they're simply relocating. They're moving to Australia. To New Zealand. So this is happening um, in small places, the most vulnerable places first. And um, right, and in the Southwest, or will, will the will the rising, you know, I, since my knowledge of climatology, that's why you're here, is uh, all of you, <coughs> uh, will those rising or, or dropping sea sea levels affect southwestern? United States? Sea level in particular for Arizona less so, but other parts of the southwest and certainly northern Mexico could have an effect. Mm -hmm. uh, another example here for the southwest would be, uh, for example, the forest fires we've seen recently uh, that are related in part to the drought, but also the, um, the bark beetle infestations that we see are driven also by environmental stress. And so what we can find is major changes on the landscape uh, that will dramatically change what the place looks like and how uh, the ecology around us will function. So there's more than enough opportunity for change. All right. Before we get to, uh, I, I don't want everyone to think Barbara, <laughs> Barbara's not getting a chance, and we will be talking about uh, disease and so on and, and climate change. But I wanted to ask you, uh, I mentioned uh, in, when I was introducing you that uh, because of the six-plus billion people that inhabit this planet, is this 
global warming climate change that we're begin that we're experiencing now a natural cycle can you tell us Andrew uh, I, I I don't know what 300 million cycle year cycle that happens and then what effect have we had in either inducing this this change so um, climate has always been changing there's not one period in the record of the entire world when climate was ever constant most of that change until relatively recently was quote unquote natural things like ice ages and El Nino and so on um, but uh, over the last hundred hundred and fifty years since we've been really pumping a lot of uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and particularly in the last 30 or 40 years when we start to see those effects uh, we have done enough to actually change the atmosphere and it seems hard to understand uh, heard that that vastness of the atmosphere uh, we could have an impact but we really do everything we do every day pumps out uh, carbon dioxide from burning coal and oil and, and, and natural gas uh, and the effects of that have been a changed climate and you just have to look around us uh, around the world to see that a uh, good example would be uh, I mentioned uh, you know the uh, uh, earlier uh, season for snow melt so we get flooding in our rivers much earlier than we used to letting some of that water go good example so um, it is indeed a reality and uh, humans are absolutely a part of the issue that is why we're so <coughs> concerned can we uh, you know David me or David mentioned uh, you know atolls and coral you know island people uh, mm -hmm. in the Pacific now not being able to to live on their it's, it's mm -hmm. their islands are disappearing That's right. so and they're moving elsewhere what about great mass migrations to livable areas Barbara you know yeah I think this really presents problems for us in a number of different arenas politically certainly economically but also health problems there are new health problems that are uh, being shared with us, if you will, from other com other parts of the world that we've never seen before. These are happening not only because of climate refugees, but also changes in climate conditions that Andrew's done a lot of research on that uh, uh, lead to new um, diseases evolving in our communities that we haven't seen before. What can you give us an example? What are, what are, what well, are medical experts seeing right we're now? We're seeing new. Uh, tropical diseases migrating this way, um, such as dengue fever, malaria, um, and other diseases that are now uh, <coughs> threatening us in this area. We've seen some other new diseases. Here in our, in our warm area, southwest they're, they're area? They're moving up through Mexico in this direction, and we expect to see those. We, um, we're seeing heat-related injuries all over the world, and that's certainly a risk for us in this community that's extremely serious. We had an event couple of, a few weeks ago in which we lost our power in a good part of the city and we had no electricity for two days in the middle of the summer and I'm not sure we're um, well organized to deal with these new um, challenges in our community we know what to do with them medically but I think we need to understand the public health implications and how we deal with these in our community in other ways um, and also uh, how to diagnose these things we've never seen before Love. But malaria and, and I can't say it, dengue, dengue, dengue. De yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, are familiar names, even though I can't pronounce it. We know that uh, we, we've heard of these diseases, but are are there mut muted, mutated, uh, mut you know, mut bacteria mutations coming up? I mean, viruses it's, that not are not so much that as we ha we haven't had these in this in this community, uh, in this part of the world. Um, so they're again from climate refugees or from changing climate conditions and many many factors that in, interactively work together to uh, cause new problems new health problems to evolve right and you know David talked uh, you know about in his you know changes are happening now in your lifetime you'll see mm -hmm. what what other changes are we experiencing now um, can you give us some examples? Well, I'm the two most important uh, sets of changes always are going to be ones related to water and precipitation, snow and, and rain, of course, especially here in the desert. The other one is temperature. Uh, and then based on those, all kinds of things go along with them and change. Um, you mentioned the Pacific Islands. If you uh, look at the uh, northern tier of the U.S. up in Alaska, melting permafrost is a huge concern. Uh, ironically, even for you know the pilings of the uh, the pipeline sinking, um, so uh, there are whole communities relocating because what was built on ice is now turning to mush. Uh, for example, uh, Alaska and the polar regions are where we really see the most dramatic uh, changes of all, uh, northern Canada or northern Asia as well. Um, but 
almost anything that relies on uh, rainfall or, or, or temperature uh, in some way will have to adapt or deal with these changes, uh, which of course is a huge component of, of our environment, uh, as well as where we get uh, you know, essential things to survive. Right. And I, and I like to look at it in terms of direct impact and indirect. You mm -hmm. ask about sea level being an issue here. We don't have a coastline here, but uh, neither did the people in Memphis uh, who had to take in Katrina refugees. Their lives changed, uh, and they, those refugees moved north. They moved to cities that uh, they may not ever leave from, and so things will change. Uh, the dynamics will shift that way. We will feel the effects mm -hmm. as populations move away from hazard zones, coastal areas uh, all over the world. We'll ha those people will have to go somewhere, and they'll bring with them their particular uh, bugs that they're probably yeah, used right. to and, and mm -hmm. comfortable living with, but you and I may not be so comfortable. We don't have an immunity to those particular diseases that they may have. So, right, uh, right. We're not, we're, not, we're not immune from other right. people's woes right. uh, in, this, in this climate struggle that we're involved in. Right. And we want you all to know that uh, uh, Andrew and Barbara and David are here um, to talk to us about this, but they're also part of a larger effort. Uh, on November 14th and 15th. It's uh, the effects of... Addressing the effects of climate change. On, uh, addressing the effects... The, uh, health, health of health, <laughs> health effects, sorry. Uh, health great, effects I'm so glad change. we... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> addressing the health effects of climate change. And uh, the, the, it's a two-day, but uh, the first day kicks off Friday, November 14th. This is free to the public. And 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. It is at... Uh, on the University uh, Medical Center uh, Duval Auditorium, and that's at 1501 North Campbell. And for more information, just go to www.untucson.org. That's untucson.org. And uh, the second all-day event uh, brings in many, many experts and discussion groups. And again, this <coughs> is addressing the health effects of climate change at UMC, University Medical Center, the Duval Auditorium. 1501 North Campbell Avenue. It is Saturday now, uh, the 15th, and that does begin at 8 a.m. and uh, is over by at 5 p.m. and all day. And for more information about registering for this, please go to Health and Climate Change Eventbrite.com. That's Health and Climate Change Eventbrite.com, and uh, you'll be able to do some registration there. Am I missing something after change? Is yeah, it there's health and climate change so dot? dot. Mm -hmm. right. So uh, watch it, and then I'll say it correctly here. Health and climate change dot event bright dot com. Mm, that's right. uh, a very, so if you have any questions or you want to know more, because we are, we'll have our own heads in the sand if we don't really recognize what's happening uh, with the world's climate and, and so on, right? They talk about, in the last year or two, six degrees. What happens when the temperature of the world the overall average temperature, I guess, rises six degrees. So talk to us a little about okay. what's happening. at one, Are we at one degree yet, and what happens? Yeah, we so we can talk in, in Fahrenheit or in, in centigrade if you want. Um, the climate models, of which there's so much talk, uh, in this century, possibly even in the next few decades, predict something like two or three degrees C, which is roughly double that, something like four to six degrees Fahrenheit of warming. Doesn't sound like much. We do, you know four degrees in an hour or two in Tucson. But for the world's average temperature, which is sort of like looking at the uh, Dow Jones for the stock market's average temperature, there's lots and lots of local change that can have huge swings in it. So there's a huge v variety behind that. And the, uh, the way to scale that is uh, the Earth's average temperature changes about six degrees C or something like um, 10 to 12 degrees Fahrenheit between an ice age and between right now. So if we then warm it an extra Degree so or two for the or three. last 10,000 years, we've only warmed up? 15 or 20 or so. We've, we've warmed up about 6-ish six, uh, degrees C, uh, or something like 10 or 12 Fahrenheit. Uh, and we're going to do 20, 30, 40 percent of that in a century in the wrong direction, the warm direction. Um, so that's why we're worried about what seems like a small number, because in fact, for the Earth's temperature as a whole, it's a big deal. Right. And in Tucson, David, your Office of Conservation and Sustainable mm -hmm. Development. Uh, are you looking at ways to prepare or mitigate some of these problems? We are. Um, that is partly why the office was created, to um, 
be the push behind the drive in the community to get this awareness built and then to start planning for both steps we can do to reduce greenhouse gases so that we don't make it any worse than it's going to be um, this change that's coming and secondly to start an adaptation planning process so that as droughts become more frequent as uh, temperatures rise and we get into some of the the, the heat effects uh, health related heat effects that Barbara mentioned uh, we'll have a plan in place um, you know, we do a lot of planning now for emergencies and they're generally short emergencies uh, one-time events so we deal with it and then we go back to life as we know it uh, we're talking about a very different kind of situation now and some people have termed a long emergency and how to plan for that when we really quite don't know where we're going. Um, some people say that we're going in climate change from climate A to climate B, but we don't know what climate B looks like and it may be from B and then to C and then to F. And we don't know because the climate is reorganizing and it won't stay in any one place for very long because of these gases that we've managed to put up there that haven't yet kicked in. Right. I have to, greenhouse gases, if we are successful in the Tucson Valley and, and perhaps in the state of Arizona in uh, bringing those levels to, you know, to mm -hmm. acceptable levels and, and, and trying to revert, can we reverse it? Can we reverse the trend of global warming? And secondly, my thing is, what do we do about those, about nations who aren't doing that? Is that going to blow our way? I mean, how does it affect, how does across the world affect my, our efforts? You know, so help. Two questions. <laughs> well, this is this is one of the great challenges uh, of uh, of the world right now, and that uh, this these gases do mix in the atmosphere, and so um, there is uh, potentially sort of a tragedy of the commons where if uh, only some people are looking after it, others will will not. Uh, right now, frankly, we're as guilty as anybody else in not doing a whole lot, and uh, if we can convince ourselves as, and, and sort of lead the world. Uh, that will go a long way to having help people follow us. But there, make no mistake, it's very tough because we're trying to um, uh, detox here and get ourselves off this drug called fossil fuel, and it's a very, very, very tough thing to do. Is there a reversal? Can we reverse it? A uh, little bit uh, more? Yeah, we, yes, we can. Change. In fact, that's, um, but it's going to take some time because we're already there's already additional warming that we haven't yet experienced in the pipeline, so to speak, because of gases that are still have yet to do their their chemistry to warm the planet. And so we will have to deal with that additional increase before we can start saying that we can reverse it. But it's going to take political will. It's going to take uh, everybody uh, acknowledging yes. that they have a stake in the solution to this, not just our generation, but every generation to come of every species, because everything's at stake here. Everything's in play. Right, right. and. Uh, before we go back and, and, and talk about maybe some ways that we can uh, begin to uh, uh, help the situation, we want you to remember that next week we hope you turn in, tune in, because it's, uh, oh, in two weeks, that's right, we have a week off next week. So November 5th, 6 p.m., it's the Tucson Money Fair, a wonderful event uh, open to the public uh, for uh, anyone, but especially those who are struggling with um, uh, insecure finances, low income, up there, tons of people there to help you. Uh, not only with, uh, they'll be able to help you with income tax, but payday loans, and it's just a great event put on by a lot of concerned agencies in our area. So November 6th, tune in to Government Connection, 6 p.m., it's the Money Fair. And I wanna get back to Barbara to get your take on um, how, how do you think uh, we can prepare for uh, these problems and, and perhaps mitigate against them? Well, I, th I think of this from both the perspective of the health professionals. I think that's very important to um, address because I think we as health professionals haven't educated ourselves enough about these issues. I climate change itself, let alone all the repercussions in the, in the health field that we need to deal with. But I also um, think we all need to take responsibility not only as health professionals but all of us in our community, each one of us doing something, doing our part. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, it's a, I liked a quote I heard from him earlier, which is, how gutsy are you? <laughs> we have to do a lot, and it's going to make ma major changes in our lives. It's true. And, <coughs> and, and When you see major changes, what do you see? Major changes in our lives. What we do need you to see? walk. We need to ride bicycles. We need to have al renewable energy on our, on our roofs, every one of us. We need to be heating our water with the sun, not with gas or electricity. 
Uh, our electricity needs to be generated from the sun. We need to be driving cars that are electric, um, if we are driving cars. We need to build our communities differently. We don't need to be building heat islands with pavement everywhere that increases the problem. We, we need to be thinking green and, and building green, not expanding out into suburbs on and on where we have to drive places all the time. We need to think very differently about how our lifestyles uh, need to be in the future. And then we need to educate ourselves about uh, not only that, but as health professionals of all kinds, we need to think about how we have to um, reorganize or organize within our communities to um, To as educate. they did, the long emergency. Huh? Yeah, long emergency. Educate ourselves about the problems, uh, understand how we need to address those, and get going and build a, a community network that really uh, is responsive to these new challenges. Right. Um, I'm an optimist, basically, despite the, the gloom of climate science and all of that. But I think what I'm optimistic about is that the human spirit, when it recognizes this challenge, will respond. And it gives us a chance, really, to rethink how we do everything, how we, how we build buildings, how we live, how we move, how we, how we power ourselves. And if we can start to uh, imagine what that new world looks like, uh, we've got a lot of people that are w willing to help create that new world. And so that's the opportunity here, I think, if we recognize that. And, uh, and, and But we've got to start acting really fast because uh -huh. uh, we're reaching a point where the, the gases are going to get so high that we may not be able to, to turn around. You mean uh, the greenhouse gases that all of the fossil fuel and our right. lifestyle... And people use terms action. like tipping points and reaching a point of no return and all of that. And that indicates a fear that we may get into some uh, with the abrupt kinds of responses from the climate that um, we can't model and, and we are very difficult to prepare for. And so we want to avoid that worst case, and mm -hmm. that means taking action now. I'll point out one more thing. The city just recently completed, uh, had completed for it a greenhouse gas inventory, and there shows a very slight reduction in residential energy use in the city of Tucson from 2005 until 2006. Now, I don't know what that's due to, but it shows that we're capable of reducing electricity demand, natural gas demand in our homes. And I think there's a, a, a menu of technologies out there and efficiency measures that we can employ uh, to, to drive that curve down. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm, again, hopeful for that reason. So, and, and in your, from your point of view, Andrew, as a climatologist, what do you see? We've already seen the polar, we're seeing the polar ice cap um, beginning to melt. Mm -hmm. uh, the islands that uh, you know David's describing in the South Pacific, is there a next area as a climatologist that globally you can say, hey, maybe this is a place we need to keep an eye on? I think we really are seeing changes almost everywhere. Uh, unfortunately for us, the Southwest is one of the bullseyes. If we look at where we see uh, some of the climate change in the next 20, 30 years, within the U.S., the Southwest is probably the one that is most likely to change. I think almost all of the climate models agree on this. Uh, and that's going to be uh, temperatures, even if we just ignore precip for a second. Uh, if it gets hotter, we all know the water evaporates right. faster. So we're <laughs> going to be challenged even on that alone um, without <coughs> complicating that with what might happen to a, a winter rainfall uh, or, or a monsoon in summer, which we really are pretty clueless about right now. It's a complicated local system that is tough to forecast and understand. Um, and uh, so I think the level of uncertainty goes way up. And we know from you know recent economic times that we don't like uncertainty at all. Uh, you need some certainty to be able to plan, and uh, this really undermines a lot of efforts and, and makes it very difficult to deal with. Right. So I would say the Southwest, we should be maybe the most worried of all. Wow. So uh, on those words, we want you to, again, uh, the first thing we can do is educate ourselves, and a great place to start is the, uh, the forum, the, the conference on health effects, uh, uh, addressing the health effects of climate change. First night, uh, Friday, November 14th, 7 to 9 p.m., free to the public, University Medical Center, uh, the Duval Auditorium, and that's at 1501 North Campbell. Uh, for more information, go to uh, untucson.org. That's untucson.org. And then the second day of the, of the conference addressing the health effects of climate change, Saturday, November 14th, is all day, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and same location, UMC, 
Duval Auditorium, 1501 North Campbell Ave. And uh, the uh, website for registration is healthandclimatechange.eventbrite.com. And uh, we don't have a ton of time left, but I know, Barbara, you want to talk about some sponsors and people that have really endorsed this, this I'd, forum. I'd just like to point out that the Friday night event is our speaker who is coming from the CDC, and uh, that will be his presentation, and then it will be followed by a panel of, of uh, experts from the community, and uh, some of them will be participating in the workshops the next day. The uh, Saturday event is all day long. Uh, it's several speakers. It's community responders, and um, in in the various health professions and and other uh, people who like David who have things to offer. Um, and then I I also wanted to point out that this is being endorsed and financially supported by a a good number of people in this community. Just to show you how important it is to our right. community and how ma many people feel it is. Uh, there's national organizations like PSR and well, council uh, And our city councilman, I know, Nina Trace yeah, off. Sustainable and Tucson, a lot of Ronnie different Glassman. groups, uh, three three or four different uh, council people, the mayor. Um, we want to get uh, the, the the health department, Pima County Health Department, will be participating in the events on Saturday. Um, these, the endorsers have, uh, you saw some quotes here from many of the endorsers. Uh, talking about people from the Red Cross, people from various other um, parts of the community that are important to this, talking about why it's important to them. Right. And in terms of resources for the public, what the community, can, where they can go to get information, I know the university has a lot of uh, great climate science information on several websites that Andrew can share. The City of Tucson at uh, uh, it's our good. TucsonAZ.gov backslash OCSD, Conservation Sustainable Development. We have a new website that has a portal into the whole topic of climate change. You oh, can wow. go in there and get information at the individual, community, regional, and national levels. All right. And on those words, we uh, I can't thank you enough, Andrew and Barbara and David. Mm -hmm. We've learned a lot, and there's a lot more for us to learn and a lot for us to do. Thank you all very thank much. Thank you very yes. much. That did go fast. <laughs> cool. <laughs>